Winston, it's a pleasure to have you on uh, Localize with us today. Uh, we're talking about very interesting topics, actually, uh, probably one of the uh, more important topics, particularly in the, in the MENA region these days. We talk about water, uh, sustainability, as well as uh, uh, in the World Bank. We have uh, with us today, uh, Winston Yu, uh, from the World Bank, uh, he's a, a professor at, uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins, I believe, University. Um, so uh, it's great to have you with us today. I believe, Winston, you have some slides that you're going to be sharing with us. Uh, and then we'll be able to ask questions. Uh, just to focus our, our talk today, I, I, there are two topics in particular that I would love to, uh, to hear your feedback and your expertise on. The first is sustainability. What, does career, what do careers in sustainability look like? What are the skills required to get into that field? And also, I'd love to hear from you about the World Bank. The World Bank as an institution is a very appealing institution. Uh, people might be wanting to get uh, in, into the World Bank. So I'd love to hear from you uh, how you got in, if you have advice, skills like that. But first, uh, please uh, introduce yourself and. Uh, Let's kick this off. OK, uh, thank you for the introductions. Let me see if I can share my screen. Yep, that's perfect. Got it, Ahmed? Yep. OK, um, well, thank you, uh, Ronit and Ahmed and Localized for um, this opportunity to share with you my passion. And um, in doing so, I, I hope I can convince you of what I view as, as one of the, our greatest existential threats to society, um, and that is the issue of water. Um, I'm gonna try to get, uh, in just the next 15 minutes, just try to convey uh, two main takeaways, okay? Um, the first relates to uh, this image. Um, it's always been a little bit of a challenge because I think if you talk to the layperson about water, uh, what typically comes to mind is photographs such as these, okay, drinking water and challenges with um, uh, providing sanitation services to people around the globe. And not to undersell that challenge because indeed, we, you know, we are talking about billions who don't have adequate drinking water and billions who don't have uh, toilets. Um, and of course, there is a very large uh, global community that is working uh, tirelessly to try to remedy this. I do want to convey that there is a much, much bigger uh, problem than just this, and that this is one piece of an unfortunately much more complex uh, challenge. And just to give you an example, um, this is a photograph by Edward Bertinsky, who's a Canadian photographer. And he, uh, several years ago, put together a, a wonderful compilation of photographs about water. And that book really challenges one to kind of think about our relationship to water, but then also the ways that human societies have altered the landscape, uh, the way human societies have strived to control nature and to sort of bend water to hum humanity's purposes. Um, and I think this is such a classic example. This is a, um, I don't know if you can uh, tell what this is, but these are irrigation um, crop circles uh, just outside of uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And the thing I want to highlight with this is the enormous food challenge we have. Now, whether you think the future will be 7 billion, 8 billion, 9 billion, 10 billion, the reality is we have a lot of people to feed today and we will have a lot more people to feed tomorrow. And central to solving that is where is the water going to come from to make that extra food? Now, from an agriculture perspective, and if you talk to experts, there's a lot that can be done all up and down the whole supply chain. For sure, we can be more efficient with what we, our inputs we use. Certainly we can do, uh, we can reduce waste. Um, there's a huge agenda about nutritious diets and whether or not we're producing the, the, the requisite requirements for people to lead, to lead uh, fulfilling lives. 
there's a huge agenda about affordability, so forth and so forth. But to my mind, um, you know, water is central to really being able to tackle this future food issue. And when I look at images like this, um, and for those of you who may have some um, uh, familiarity with what has been happening in, you know, in California and the recent droughts, there's always questions that will arise about, should we be doing this with the resource we have? Should we be growing crops in the middle of deserts? Should we be, in this particular case, growing crops that are for export as opposed for local domestic consumption? And so, you know, these are difficult economic, political, and perhaps even ethical questions. But what I wanted to highlight was not only is water important for drinking, but if you think about the fact that we need 70 times more water to produce the food we need than what you require for drinking, it's a, it's a huge concern about where that water is going to come from. Now, food, drinking water, what else does water help us with? Well, we have a growing energy crisis in many parts of the world, um, especially in the context of climate change and the push towards renewables, biofuels take water, and hydropower um, requires water. This is um, a dam on the Yangtze River in China. And this dam, uh, you know, obviously the discussions on dams is mired in lots and lots of controversy. And we could have a whole session just talking about uh, dams. Um, but I do want to highlight that in most cases, dams are being built to serve many uses. So this dam not only is generating hydropower, but it's probably also providing water for irrigation, for food. It's probably providing water for cities and municipal uses for drinking. It's also probably providing water uh, or holding back water for flood protection. And the point I wanna make here is for as long as civilization has existed, uh, humanity has understood that you know, some level of control or some infrastructure is needed to be able to satisfy all the different needs that societies have. Okay, and because we are uh, um, dealing with a single resource, conflicts are going to arise. Mm -hmm. um, now, this infrastructure, uh, you don't, this is not anything new. Um, if you think about uh, Roman aqueducts, if you think about it in the Middle East, actually, you have remnants of a lot of ancient uh, water infrastructure. This is an ancient steppe well. So this is, I think, 11th or 12th century in Rajasthan, India. Water infrastructure has existed as long as civilizations have existed. And in fact, some would argue that civilizations have come and gone on its ability to manage this resource. Now, when we deal with a single resource and having to make choices about where the water goes, we are also making choices about who gets water, where and when. And I don't know if uh, this image is clear. Um, uh, it, it's again taken by er Edward Bertinsky. On the right-hand side is a suburb outside of Phoenix, Arizona. And on the left-hand side is a Native American reservation. And this stark division, I think, really begins to illustrate uh, this connection between water, equity, and even power. Okay, and when I mean political power. I um, teach a course at SICE and um, I always tell my students that rivers are political systems. And unfortunately, the boundaries of our river systems seldom intersect with the political administrative boundaries that we, we create. Um, rivers are often flowing across political boundaries. And in fact, we have you know, over 200 plus international rivers between countries. And so you can imagine um, dealing with rivers between, uh, within states, but then dealing with rivers across boundaries between countries, highly, highly political. And again, what I'm saying right now is nothing new that people haven't long recognized. Uh, if you think about the word rivalry, that comes from the Latin word rivalis, which means one using the same stream as another. Or if you look at the Chinese character for politics, zhe, that character has a water radical built into it. So somehow, you know, language already embodies this idea that I'm trying to convey about water and power. Now, um, three images. I don't know if you know what these three places have in common. 
Well, I'll tell you the answer. Uh, certainly North Uldra doesn't exist. Uh, these are uh, images from three movies. The first movie on the top is Quant The Quantum of Solace, which is a James Bond film. Um, and in this picture, um, this is the, the story is about a villain who has uh, essentially taken control over the water supply in Bolivia. The lower left hand um, uh, image uh, is, is uh, a favorite in our household. This is from Frozen 2. Um, and that's a dam which is central to the tension between the natives that lived in this area um, and the, so to speak, conquerors that would come into this area. And then finally, the image on the lower right-hand side is from the 1974 film, Chinatown. Um, if you haven't seen that film, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful film. It's a classic noir detective film, but it's set against a very real historical story about Los Angeles. Um, if you know the story of Los Angeles and the California aqueduct, there was a gentleman uh, around the turn of the century named William Mulholland. If you ever get to Los Angeles, you'll, you'll find a Mulholland Drive fairly easily. But he was the uh, head of the, water and the Los Angeles Water and Power Development Authority. And he's responsible for not only the main aqueduct, the LA aqueduct, but also securing the water rights upstream of Los Angeles, essentially making Los Angeles what it is today. Interestingly, he is quoted as um, saying, if you don't get the water, you won't know you need it. Now, history is interesting. Um, the, there are some that allege that the manner in which he secured those water rights were under nefarious means. Um, others argue that you know, you had rural communities that were looking to get out of agriculture anyways. And so for them, it was a no brainer. The reality is somewhere I'm sure in between, but the point is, is uh, this individual had a vision for a growing city, which um, had he not secured those water rights, Los Angeles would not be what it is today. So the last thing I wanna mention is, um, you know, so we've talked a little bit about the political dimensions around water, conflict, um, water for food and many other things. I'd like you to think about um, your religious practice if you have one and if you, part, if you participate in one. And just take a step back and think about the way water plays in your stories or your practice. It's no surprise that um, you know, across most religions, water is central to spiritual life, um, symbolizing everything from fertility to absolution, um, to you know, cleansing of your sins. Um, this image here is from the Kumela in India. This is the largest Hindu festival um, in the country. And what you've seen here are people going to the banks of the holy Ganges River and taking a dip into that river to cleanse their sins. Okay, now from a technocratic perspective, I look at this river and um, for those of you who may know, the Ganges River is also one of the most polluted rivers in the world. A tremendous amount of industrial waste flows uncontrolled into this river. You have huge cities all up and down this river that at best have wastewater treatment. Most don't. And if we think about the ecosystems and um, you know, the, the aquatic life that is impacted by all of that, you know, how do we even think about beginning to quote, clean this river up? And how do we think about it in the context of, again, the spiritual and religious importance that this river plays for these communities and these people? Okay. So just to summarize this big first point I wanna make is that water serves many different constructive functions. And so while most people are focused on the human health aspects, so drinking water and sanitation, we have to keep in mind that we need water to sustain our aquatic ecosystems and the flora and fauna, biodiversity, a whole range of important um, environmental stewardship issues. Water, uh, we didn't even talk about navigation in many countries, inland navigation is quite important. So you need water for that. Water also as a carrier for erosion and pollutants. Biomass production, a tremendous amount of water is needed to produce food, timber, biofuels, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and then finally water needed for cooling to generate energy or even more directly hydropower. And so you have all of these different functions competing for a singular resource. And 
we also have the flip side. You know, I, I tell my students that water is not an average resource, meaning that we can never look at water in an average way. Uh, there's so much variability in the hydrologic cycle. And in fact, we sometimes have conditions where we've got too little water or we've got too much water for yeah. it's in flood droughts. Okay, so how do you manage the constructive and destructive elements? Now, just to conclude, you know, does, does any of this really matter in terms of things we're interested in? Um, you know, uh, going to my, your question about the World Bank, you know, we're interested in, in poverty reduction, we're interested in growth. I just want to show you this is um, the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report from 2016. Um, there's some more up to date um, surveys, but it's essentially telling the same story. Um, these are surveys of industry leaders, governments, academics, asking them to highlight what are the big risks. And let's look at just for the next 10 years, water crises is at the very top, failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, when we talk about mitigation there, we are looking at how we reduce our energy usage. When we look at adaptation, typically we are thinking about how uh, we um, uh, adapt to water related um, uh, uh, pressures. Extreme weather events, what are we talking about here? Probably floods, drought, cyclones, food crisis. I already mentioned, you know, water is a big part of that food crisis. So no matter how you cut it, um, water uh, permeates a whole range of risks that, that uh, writ large people identify as major concerns. Mm -hmm. So one of the things um, you know, we do at the World Bank is, is you know, we, with our clients, we talk a lot about building water security. Um, and you know, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to properly define, um, but I think when you start thinking about all the different ways water um, is used in a society, in, in a country, um, the way it impacts relationships between different groups of people, different countries, um, you know, using the security lens uh, makes some sense. And typically we talk about uh, the building blocks of water security uh, being investments and having sustainable investments, institutions. I mean, we could spend a lot of time talking about mm -hmm. institutions and what we need there. And then finally information. So uh, just to wrap up this portion, I mentioned I was going to say two things, two points. One is I've made the point about water touching many different things and it's beyond just drinking water. The second point comes to this. Water is perhaps the most um, complex resource from the technical, economic, social, environmental, political, cultural, historical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, perspective. And so what this means for all of you in terms of careers and water and sustainability that we really need a very diverse set of skills to tackle these challenges. This problem is not going to be solved by engineers. It's not gonna be solved by economists, but it'll be solved by engineers, economists, social anthropologists, political economists, conflict management specialists, so forth and so forth. And so really uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the opportunity there is enormous in part because this challenge is equally enormous. So um, that I just wanted, that's all I wanted to present. Um, maybe just a little bit on career. Um, you know, I get asked often by my students, you know, how did I get into this field? Um, I have to say that there was a little bit of a, um, it was a little bit of a chance. Um, I started my graduate school days thinking I was going to work on super fund issues here in the United States and deal with you know, contamination of water supplies from military bases and, uh, you know, spent nuclear fuel and these kinds of things. I got very lucky in that a, a former grad student friend of mine was at the World Bank for a summer and he uh, was working actually on the Ganges and asked if I would come and spend the summer with him doing some modeling work. And so I did. And um, it was being there that I learned about the arsenic issue in Bangladesh and that just piqued my interest and um, the rest is history. I ended up spending six years of my life um, studying and, under and trying to understand that problem and trying to come up with solutions to it. Um, I later then, um, uh, you know, went through a couple of postdocs and wasn't quite sure if academics was right for me. And so then I um, joined uh, what is called the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And it's a fellowship program where they put scientists in government. So I was 
actually working in the U.S. State Department. Um, this was during Bush days uh, um, after the Iraq War, uh, uh, working to reopen um, irrigation canals and systems that Saddam had closed off to the Kurdish areas. And so, you know, it was sort of my first uh, real life um, uh, experience with, you know, uh, the uh, uh, sort of the political dimension the political of, side, yeah, of the water. People, yeah. yeah, and how people use water um, as can use it as as a, uh, a, a weapon. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, didn't, um, you know, I think two years in government was enough for me. And so then after that, I I um, uh, jumped over to the World Bank where I've been for the last 15 years, mostly working on projects um, in South Asia, Central Asia, a little bit in East Asia, um, worked a little bit on the Nile program. Uh, so working on relationships between Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt, yeah. um, and then uh, currently working in West Africa. So it's a lot to do, and I, I hope I, I've convinced uh, you all to uh, pursue careers in this area. Okay, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Winston, so much. The, 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 I mean, it, it really, your presentation really highlights the importance of water and, and, and true, the, the complexities around uh, water. And I always find it fascinating, actually, that water you have on the same earth, right? we're 70% water, right? But there's such a deep shortage of water in so many different places around the earth but the water is almost there. It's like it's the, it's there, but you can't really use. It. And I guess that goes back to to your point about is the quality of the water is there contamination? No, I mean salt obviously is not contamination, but you can't really use salt water for much in terms of um, the, the the functions of water that you had uh, that you had mentioned. Uh, and actually, one of the this is quite close to me personally because actually my my family own a farm. Uh, we, we, it's, a, it's in the desert, we use well water, and it's salty. So it really limits your ability uh, to use that water to grow crops and to, and to so, um, uh, so, so thank you very much. That was a great introduction. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig a little bit deeper first on water. So at, at first, I want to ask you, why water? And when did you know that this was going to be your, your career? At what point in your, in your career that what was it made, like the decision was made, like this is going to be it? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I, um, you know, as an undergrad, um, you know, I think like many of us, we're not quite sure how we find our place in this world and what we want to do. Um, I think I've always, had this feeling that um, on the environment side, there's, a, there's an enormous agenda. And, you know, just for the record, I, I should mention that, you know, when I was a teenager, um, I, I would find myself in front of the World Bank protesting. So, you know, I think, I think you know, I have evolved over time in, in how I think about things, but I've, I've always been interested in, in kind of environmental justice and environmental issues. Um, and so, you know, why, I mean, to, to be frank, I think uh, the, my interest in some of the ground, original groundwater stuff was primarily because of, of, there was a professor that I really liked and he was doing really interesting stuff. You know, for me, I think it's always important to find things that are interesting to you and, and you know, mm -hmm. spend time to dig in and really explore. I really loved my my graduate school days and that intellectual freedom and just the access to ideas and talking to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I would say that I've, I've always been sort of interested in it. And the more I do it, the more I, I become convinced that it really is such an important topic. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't always get the attention that other things get, mm -hmm. um, you know. So, you know, it's one of these resources where, um, we, um, you know, I think we take it for granted probably, um, you know, and on groundwater, you know, you don't even see it. So people don't even yeah. think about it. I think that was, that was what drew me to groundwater in the beginning was, you know, um, I had been working on some nuclear waste issues and, you know, people oft, often, uh, you know, if, if you spilled something, you wouldn't really worry about it because, you know, where does it go? 
you know, out of sight, out of mind kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my, my interest in water was, has always been tied to bigger environmental sustainability um, issues. Do you mind if I ask you, what, what did you study as an undergrad? So as, a, as an undergrad, um, I, I studied both engineering and, and economics. And um, okay. I, I had a little bit of a switch. So I, I, I started off doing um, bioengineering. So I was, I was at the time I was interested in kind of the medicine profession. Mm -hmm. And, you know, economics, I was, I was interested in the math and, and, and whatnot. And the, the turning point for me was, you know, most of my friends as an undergrad went off to start, you know, medical companies and this kind of thing. And I, I wasn't so interested in that. I wanted to do something that I, I would find some meaning. Um, and okay. that's when I sort of started to look at environmental issues a little bit more closely. Yeah, yeah. So, so, the, so the, the starting point was the environmental issues in general, and then you, from there, you you specialized into water, and, and that's actually quite interesting because it's different than what than usually the thinking for students coming out of particularly undergrad or even grad school is. Uh, I look at this a function as opposed to a topic, right? Because water is a topic and then underneath that, there's so many different things that you can do. And, and you took that approach. I, I find that really very interesting. My experience when I talk to a lot of students, they're thinking, do I want to be a uh, finance? Do I want to get into engineering? Do I want to get into tech? It's more industry specific as opposed to a specific, uh, as, a, as a specific topic. What, 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 did you struggle with that, or was that very clear for you from the get-go that, that water was the general topic, and then we see what we can do under that, or is that something that you that you had to uh, uh, think about and make maybe a conscious decision of of not to go to the functional approach, I guess, or the industry approach? Yeah, no, I mean that's a good question. I mean, I, I think for me, um, and in part, what drew me to the World Bank is this mission of, you know, trying to eliminate po poverty and trying to, uh, you know, be useful in this life. Um, and, you know, I, I guess, you know, maybe, I don't know if I was, I don't know how deliberate I, I, I really was with this. I mean, I think, um, I mean, when I look at the World Bank, you know, I've got a lot of colleagues who work on a whole range of issues from education, health, transport, energy. Um, and, you know, we of course have debates about, which topics are more important. Of course, it's all important, right? It's all, uh, you know, uh, like if we, go, if we go back to Amartya Sen, you know, development as freedom, you know, it's all, it's all critically important. I think, you know, I, I started more interested on the environment side and earth science. And I don't know, it, it, it checked off a lot of boxes for me. Mm -hmm. um, certainly I could have gone in different directions. And that's what I think is interesting is that if, we, if I look at my colleagues, um, I have a lot of colleagues coming from different backgrounds and some not even from water to start with. You know, you may have a, yeah. an agricultural economist who finds him or herself focusing more on irrigation issues, or yeah. you might find a, you know, a civil engineer who uh, is now involved in dams. I mean, it's, you know, people kind of come to it at different places. And I think that's what's cool about it because there is so many different parts of this puzzle. Yeah. So, so, so let me ask you then. So, so your colleagues, I'm, I'm assuming they're all uh, quite well established in their in their various fields. Your colleagues at the World Bank, right? But, but they weren't. They didn't start off like that. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, neither did you, right? So, is there a time that is appropriate in your development in terms of education or even careers that you might? in your opinion, that you decide, okay, you know what, this is what I really I want to focus on. Is there a time for that? Is there a right time for that? Or is there a process uh, that you that you can maybe advise? It's always on? the right time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll tell you that um, I think that the biggest thing is going and seeing things. Mm -hmm. um, for me, during my graduate school days, I mean, spending months and months in the field with people to understand, you know, people's relationships to the water resource. In this case, you know, I was interested in a small community, and um, you know, we were we spent a lot of time 
uh, measuring arsenic levels in wells throughout this community, marking them green, safe, red, you know, understand how people, their habits with the water, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, until you really get deep into it, um, I think that's when you really start to appreciate things. And, and that's, again, what I love about the World Bank is, you know, we, we sit at a very unique, and not, not just the World Bank, but actually all of the international financial institutions, the Islamic Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, you know, you, you sit at this, this place between what's happening to people at the local field level, and then also governments, right? Because governments have responsibilities to provide services for its citizens and to properly sustainably manage the resource. And we sit in between, yes, we're also a bank and that we are providing financing, but hopefully at the end of the day, we are helping governments make better choices and better decisions and are doing things that will help and enable um, citizens to be, you know, full, full participants. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, uh, certainly when, when you're young and you can travel, you can go and see things that that's critical. Um, it gets more difficult, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. the older you get, but, um, you know, any opportunity you have to go and see real things um, on the, on the ground, I, I would so, so let me dig dig deeper a little bit into that because I, I do I think that's very interesting indeed. And maybe through the World Bank, once you get into a position like the world, you have access to you're able to go into the field because there are so many projects happening and that really allows you, it gives you that access. What if I'm not yet in the World Bank? And, and, and the next topic I'm going to talk to you is about getting into the World Bank, getting into the fields of sustainability and more specifically water. But what if I'm still not there yet? Right? Because I think there are quite um, there are requirements that you need to fulfill before you take that step into the World Bank. Right? What, what can I do before then? Okay. Well, uh, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of different things um, depending on your your interests. Um, I mean, for me, um, to be quite uh, frank, you know, I, I wasn't so ready to jump into um, that kind of environment. I, 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 you know, my my PhD days were some of my best, as I mentioned, because I had a lot of intellectual freedom. And I needed to go through that uh, to get to where I am now. For me, not everyone wants that. You know, uh, I do think there are you know skills you, one needs to learn. Um, depending on what your interests are, um, you know, because it is indeed comp a complex topic. Um, so, and there so, is a so let's focus on sustainability and, and water focus. So what are, what are the skills, in your opinion, that are important to get into that field? Okay. Well, but part of it depends on what we mean by sustainability. <laughs> and sorry, sorry to sorry to make it complicated, but it is true because you know the um, we all have a sense of what sustainability means, but you know different disciplines take it differently. Um, okay. You know, I, I I would say again, and I, I will be very upfront that I come at it perhaps more from an engineering and science background. But when I think about sustainability um, from a water perspective, I think about the hydrologic cycle. I think about how you know, every time, because water touches on so many different things, every time you change something, you are probably changing, it's, it's, it's affecting something somewhere else in the system, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to understand those systems. Um, you know, I'll give you a really, clear example, just, just uh, out of my own experience. You know, we talk a lot about in the agriculture side, um, trying to be more efficient with water use. Yeah. Okay. And everyone says, oh, be, be more efficient, be more efficient. And there are engineering solutions to being more efficient. But actually, you know, the reality is, is when farmers are more efficient, they're actually going to do more of it. So if you have a, if you have an, a high efficiency irrigation system, if you don't have constraints on land, you can actually just expand it. And in the end, you actually might be consuming more water than you did before. Ah, okay. Right. Okay. And, you know, is that, is that a sustainable, uh, you know, is, it, is that sustainable? Probably not. And again, you know, on what time horizon are we, we, we talking about? Yeah. So, you know, I, I do think, you know, for, um, sustainability, again, just to summarize, you know, means different things to different people, but from a, from a kind of more engineering uh, earth science perspective, I do think thinking about 
the landscape and how everything's connected, we have a, a long ways to go to fully understanding our, our system. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, you know, maybe you're interested in water and agriculture, in which case the system you need to understand is agricultural food systems, mm -hmm. the whole value chain, you know, um, needing to understand inputs and, you know, what do good seeds and good fertilizers mean for production and then processing, you know, that whole system. So I, I think more systems approaches and thinking is, is what we need in the water field. Okay, that's it. So, so, so is there getting into the water field uh, and, and I, you, you, you did an undergraduate degree, then you did a PhD, right, directly. And then you, uh, and from there you were, you had a lot of freedom to, to think about water and you got into the World Bank. Is that, is, is a PhD needed? Is, is, uh, it, is it a must? I know obviously there's obviously a lot of benefits to it, right? And, and you're a PhD holder, so does everybody need to go through that? No, and again, I'm probably being a, a little bit more cynical than I need to be, but you know, it, it certainly is not required. Um, and in some respects, maybe it's it's a, a negative mark against you. And the reason I say this, the, the reason, and I'm I'm joking, I'm half joking, but let me let me explain. Um, you know, I had a, a mentor um, who passed away, uh, I think it's about six, seven years ago. He used to talk about how um, the problem in our sector in water is that uh, researchers uh, don't practice. So they don't get into the field and they aren't practical. And practitioners like we have at the bank don't read. So we don't really make best use of the latest science and research. And it, I, I think he's absolutely right. We have a, a challenge in the bank where we're very good at doing projects. Okay? Mm -hmm. But I think we have a lot more to we have a lot more learning to do from those projects. Every project, in my view, is a social experiment. You're dealing with humans. You don't know how people are going to behave, right? You can mm -hmm. you can build a piece of infrastructure, but how is that infrastructure actually going to be used? You know, how, what's the relationship of the communities that derive benefits from this, you know, all of that is so interconnected. And so I think we have a long ways to go in bridging that divide between research and, and practice. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to answer your question, no, you don't need a, a PhD. I mean, unless you really wanted to join the research department at the bank, um, and you know, there is a specific one there, but I, I would say most of my colleagues, you know, have masters. Um, and again, they come from lots of different backgrounds, financial management to uh, health, you know, a whole bunch of different stuff. And, and they're all now working in water, basically. Yeah, yeah, we've got uh, 200 plus colleagues working on various pieces of it. I mean, it's, it's exciting. And I think, um, you know, even though it is a bureaucracy uh, and all yeah. big bureaucratic institutions have its challenges, but um, the the um, set of people and the diversity of skill sets, diversity of experiences from all countries of the world makes it a really interesting place. Yeah, so, 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 so let, let's dig a bit deeper into that. The World Bank, uh, appealing institutions. I remember uh, going to school in, in Washington, DC, thinking oh, I'd love to graduate and work in the bank, World Bank, just as a name, right? It's, it was a, it's a name that's appealing but I really didn't know much about the World Bank that, then. So, so, so tell me, what, what is it like to work into the World Bank? Are there opportunities for young students to work in the World Bank that you know of? Are there opportunities for, for people living or, or studying in the Middle East to, to work with the World Bank? I, I'd love to hear more about this for me. Okay, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of opportunities, there's tons of opportunities. Um, you know, there are several uh, main hiring mechanisms. There's something called the Young Professionals Program, which anyone can apply to. Um, certainly one of the um, criteria in selection is looking for diversity of skills and diversity of backgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's extremely important in, in our work. Um, for sure, in our Middle East, North Africa uh, region, um, you know, I would encourage people to reach out to uh, uh, the, the local offices out there to just have conversations. 
um, you know, depending on what your skill set may be, uh, there may be loads of opportunities. As I said, you know, it, it you know, there's there's so much to do. Um, everything from, you know, kind of basic, um, uh, uh, you know, with these projects, our teams are quite large, and especially, um, you know, if we're talking about a project, for instance, um, you know, in Yemen or you know, in the field. I mean, I think having um, good local people with knowledge is extremely important, especially, you know, given that water is so political, an yeah. understanding of the political situation is extru- is really, really important. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't just bring an idea from any place and just drop it into a country and expect it to work. And so, you know, I, I find that also fascinating, um, getting to learn about a country, the history, culture, the politics, all of that actually matters. And so I think having good localized knowledge is extremely important for for us. You know that localized knowledge hopefully becomes global, and it gets you know whatever we learn in one place we transfer to another place. And I think you know that's again one of the appealing things about the about the bank is that we are um, encouraged, if not forced, to move around a bit. Mm-hmm. So we see different things, and we you know we kind of share our experiences. Yeah. So, so you, you mentioned skills a couple of times. In the last section, you mentioned skills a, a few times. By skills, because right, when we think about skills as localized, uh, we, we split up skills into two sections. There, there's technical skills where you go to schools. It's a, it's a more formal uh, learning process, but there are also soft skills. Now, the technical skills, from what I understand, and please correct me if, I, if I'm mistaken, you're looking for a very diverse set of technical skills. You have people with very different backgrounds. So do well in your technical skill. If there's a need for it, there's a space for you uh, probably in the World Bank. But, but then that means uh, then, then, then you must look at other skills as well. You must look at soft skills and that's probably how you're able to compare candidates with each other, right? So, so what are these other sets of non-technical skills that you think are most important for uh, work in the World Bank? I'll ask you a couple of questions. So the most important set of skills, um, how do you think students or recent graduates that are wanting to work at the World Bank can develop these skills? And finally, what can a, a, a potential candidate do to really showcase those skills if he's applying uh, to work in, in, in your department, for example? Okay, yeah, those are all great questions. So, it's a lot, I can repeat <laughs> them for you. <laughs> okay, but uh, let, me, let me just say on, on the soft skills, which um, in my view are, let me be very clear, equally as important as the technical skills. You know, I, um, my job, as I said, is not only dealing with farmers and, um, you know, sort of small communities and individuals, but also governments. And um, what I'm constantly thinking about is how I built trust with the government counterparts that I'm working with um, so that I can further uh, what, what might be some technical solutions. Um, you know, the reality is um, uh, changing behaviors and making change is not easy, right? For a variety of reasons. Some of it might be entrenched interests, which, okay, that's something you have to deal with. In some case, it might be uh, fear of the unknown. All of these things end up kind of coming back to whether or not the person in front of you trusts you and believes in what you're trying to put forward. Um, So, you know, those soft skills, you only... You know, you only develop by practicing and doing. Uh, you know, I have to say, you know, everywhere I've worked, I've tried my best to learn uh, local languages. Um, you know, because it makes a big difference, right? I mean, um, I, I spent a lot of time in Central Asia, um, in Uzbekistan, trying to learn Russian because I, I, if I, if I, if I could learn some Russian, uh, I, I could see that they would be more amenable to me. Uh, so, you know, there's, you know, a lot of it is about, um, you know, doing your best to really understand the positions people are in, 
You know, I'll give you one example. You know, um, in, in irrigation, one of the things we try to do is to decentralize uh, management. And, you know, that requires, in, uh, when I was working in India, that requires um, the main bureaucracies to give up a little bit of their power and their control. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to uh, illustrate to our counterparts why in the end this would actually be a good thing for them and also for their communities. And, you know, I would go and visit some of these um, very remote um, irrigation systems and, you know, literally we're, we're talking about a couple days travel on unpaved roads and, you know, at some point I realized that, wow, you know, I, you know, it is such a struggle to get out to these remote areas. How can I expect the engineers I'm working with to do this trip on a, on a regular basis, right? You know, I started to realize, I was like, oh, okay, I, I come here and I'm going to these places. It's really hard to get to. And I'm trying to, I'm expecting my counterparts to do the same on a more frequent basis. You know, and then that got us thinking about, okay, well, we need to, in addition to um, improving these systems, we need to improve the roads. If we want to get people to come out here, we need to make sure there's other services such as good schools so they can bring their uh, families. You know, all of a sudden you start realizing that yeah. there's lots of things you need you need to do. Yeah. Um, engaging in that conversation with the counterparts, they, they tend to see that, okay, actually, yeah, you, you really want to do something here and you're, you're coming up, you're trying to come up with solutions. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it, there's a, a degree of trust you're trying to build and um, it's really about listening very actively and trying to understand, um, you know, what are some of the barriers to change? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, so so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back a little bit on the skills because there's one question in particular that I think is, is very important because soft skills in particular can be challenging to show. Right, because because I can write on a CV that I'm great at uh, at uh, communications. I'm uh, an excellent people person, right? But but then everybody can write that on their CV. Is there something that you look for for candidates applying to the World Bank? And I'm sure you you've come across uh, CVs and and candidates in your team. Maybe there's somebody that did something that was interesting but the question is how can i as a student really showcase a soft skill that i have that i think is important um that, that separates me from the from other candidates yeah i mean you're, you're right it, it's hard to convey that through a cv yeah. and I, I think most people recognize that i i do think the conversation face-to-face -face conversation or you know like even on zoom is, is, is important. Um, and, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, hu humility goes a long way. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I certainly have colleagues who, um, uh, uh, well, let me just say, you know, um, when you're in a situation with a government, um, and it's not your own government, you know, the last thing they want is someone like me coming to them and telling them what what I think is best, right? Yeah. And me coming in and telling them that I know the answers, right? I think always listening and humility is important because uh, this work is one, extremely important, and two, extremely complex. And none of us knows the answer. We're all figuring this out together. Um, this is a shared challenge. And so I, I like to frame it like that. And, and I think, you know, um, I think recognizing that this is bigger than any one of us, I think is, is an important quality to, yeah. to yeah. express. Uh, but I, I do think, you know, you know, getting in front of somebody and, and, and talking, um, you know, is, 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 a, is a better way to communicate, um, you know, your personality and, um, and these soft skills you may have. Uh, great, thank you for that. And I think you, you explained that very well, right? Because because there's a lot of um, the, the flexibility, the, the ability to ch think on your feet, address a problem as a community, as a group of people thinking towards a common solution. These are all actually very important skills that, that, uh, that, that you can develop and you can uh, work on. You know, uh, if I just make, oh, sorry, sorry, just one, please, one quick please, point. Please. Um, you know, in the um, young professionals um, program at the World Bank, during the interview process, 
Um, one of the things they do is they put people into teams with a specific problem and they observe. And yeah. so, you know, I, I think that that's also another thing to think about is, um, you know, practicing working in teams. At SAIS, um, we do uh, practicums, which are, are groups of four students working together. And I think, you know, working in a team is, is hard, um, but I think is, is a good skill to really develop. And, you know, I'll admit that in the beginning, I think for me, it was really hard. I, I was definitely your classic researcher, put me in a room, close the door, don't see me for a couple months. Like that's how I, I work, but, you know, being at the bank now, you know, I'm having to work with people with yeah. different ideas and, you know, having to learn how to navigate. That's really, really important for an organization as big as the world bank. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe, maybe smaller NGOs, you have less of that, but you're always going to be working in teams. So I think that's, that's a good skill, a sp important soft skill. I think people should uh, uh, spend active time trying to develop. So, so you mentioned World Bank and smaller uh, NGOs. I wanted to just talk about that a little bit, and I, and I do realize we're, we're coming close to, to our time. So if anybody does have a question from our audience, please do uh, type it on the chat. Um, so water is a big issue and uh, requires big budgets, requires big uh, decisions. And, and like you say, governments are pretty much always involved. So the World Bank is uniquely positioned to address governments. What if I'm? What if I don't want to work at the? What, what if that's too big of an organization for me? Right? You mentioned smaller NGOs. Are, are there other opportunities for me to get into sustainability, to get into water, and more specifically, that doesn't that is not the World Bank? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, but, but, yeah, no, I mean, the World Bank is just one actor of many, many, many actors. And to be frank, again, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sound overly cynical. I, I don't know, you know, maybe there was a time when the, uh, the bank was perhaps the only organization out there working on this topic, but now there are so many. I think the thing to ask yourself is what part of the problem do you want to work on? Um, and what kind of role do you want to play? You know, for instance, just on the drinking water agenda, there are so many NGOs out there that that is their main purpose is to provide drinking water to small local communities or help them with, with uh, the financing challenges. I mean, you might be familiar, you know, Matt Damon, the famous actor, I mean, he's got his own charity, Leonardo DiCaprio, another, I mean, there's so many groups out there um, working not only on actually trying to get people drinking water, but also even advocacy. If you're interested in water and agriculture, lots and lots of both research organizations and small NGOs um, actively working in this area to lobby governments and to lobby uh, international organizations to, to you know, provide more financing, et cetera. Um, on the environment and water side, I mean, you've got all the classic World, uh, 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 World Wildlife Federation, the Nature Conservancy, World Resources Institute, all of these organizations um, have uh, people who are focused on, on water dimensions. You also have um, different governments will have um, their own development arms, which might be doing water related activity. And then finally, you could go and actually work for your local communities. You could work for local governments. Every local government has somebody thinking about water. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, just here in Washington, DC, uh, the you know, DC WASA, the water authority here is doing super innovative stuff. Um, the Department of Environment here is doing all these wonderful green roofs. And, you know, there's so much happening. I think um, yeah. the hard part is actually taking that first step. Um, yeah. But I promise you, if you take that first step in this direction, you, you won't regret it. So, so let, let me ask, there's a question from the audience, but before I get to that, I, I wanted to ask you about one, one last, last question from my side, or probably one of the last ones, I, innovation. Right, I hear, and, and, and the one that really stands out in my mind, and I really, I don't know how significant that is, the, the Bill Gates trying to build a, a system that changes sewage water uh, into drinkable water on site, right? So that, that's one that just comes to, what, what are the innovation, where do you see the future of this? Do you see 
you see a positive, obviously, I hope you do, <laughs> you're in it, but where do you see the future of this going and where do you see the innovation towards this going and is there opportunities in that? Uh, yes, and yes, that? and yes, and yes. I mean, <laughs> just, just look at desalinization in the Middle East. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, it was prohibitively expensive. Now, throughout the Middle East, you see heavy usage of, of desalinization. Those technologies have become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, the stuff that Bill Gates is doing, yeah, there's lots of room for innovation. I would say the other innovation is on the big data side of things and machine sure. learning and improving efficiencies of utilities and energy systems, all that stuff. So yeah, I mean, it's um, the World Economic Forum, if you're interested, has published a report called the Fourth Industrial Revolution on Water. And, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting document because it lays out uh, new technologies and what it will do in terms of the way we think about, about water. So yes, lots of innovations and lots of opportunities to be innovative. Perfect. I'm going to try to get to a couple of questions. We have a, a question from Hela, and uh, you, you might have answer, answered a section of this, a part of this. She says to specialize in water or other specific topics, what kind of a PhD do you need? I mean, there's different PhDs. Um, as I said, you, you could, uh, I think the most important thing is, is to find something you're interested in and the question you're interested in, in answering. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think for the water field, there's no single answer to that. Um, the challenges, hopefully, as I showed, spans engineering, economics, agriculture, health, so forth and so forth. So there's a lot of a lot of areas. And then, uh, and then, uh, Hela had asked a, a second question: Are opportunities equally spread in all nationalities based off one's professional skills, or is there a tendency to accept uh, more like native English speakers? And I believe this is probably uh, about the World Bank. So. Is there uh, is there like international hires happening at the World Bank? Is that a, is that something that that is considered, or is it more on your skills, your knowledge, and what you can offer? Um, you know, it's certainly both. Uh, I mean, let me let me say, I mean, because the World Bank is the World Bank, I mean, we do operate um, in English. But having said that, um, as I mentioned earlier, because of the trust we're trying to build, uh, being able to speak. Arabic, Chinese, French, Spanish, whatever. I mean, that's really, really important. Um, and certainly, as I mentioned, you know, in every country I've worked in, I've tried to learn local language because it, you know, it sort of it shows that I'm trying to really understand uh, the local conditions. So, uh, language skills beyond English are extremely important uh, to the World World Bank. Great. And then we, ha we have a last question that I'm going to ask you. This was uh, asked by, sorry, I'm just pulling up the screen, uh, Aya. Uh, she'd like to ask, does taking a volunteering opportunity of sustainable development, and she mentioned the American University in Cairo, but I think uh, this applies to any university, would this be useful in getting into water issues field? Yeah, I mean, any chance you have to to volunteer and, as I said, um, uh, get those real life experiences really do matter. Um, you know, the, at the bank, uh, we talk about this T profile, meaning that you know we want people to have a broad um, set of experiences, but at the same time, you know depending on what your academic background, technical skills are, you know you do need to have sort of one, technical area, whether it's, you know, you're good with finance or you're good with engineering, economics, whatever. But then, you know, I think we recognize that there's other kinds of knowledge out there than besides the, the traditional. And so I, I think, um, you know, the bank is good in that sense that we, we value all sorts of skills and that diversity, I think, leads to more innovation, right? I think we're, we're actively trying not to just get the same kinds of people. Um, yeah. And, and I, I'm not talking about just I'm not talking about the water sector specifically, but I, I would say broadly in any kind of development institution and development problem, you need a lot of different um, uh, perspectives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Winston, thank you so much for your time. Before, before we close up, I just wanted to just highlight something that really, really stuck with me today is that if you want to get into water, there's so many different opportunities. 
there is so the, the, the backgrounds can be so diverse. You can talk about finance people, engineer. You, you mentioned big data, which is like really hip these days. It's one of the really in topics these days, right? A technology, innovation. There's so many different aspects that can feed into sustainability and water. And, 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 it's, and that's, that's great to really see that or hear that uh, coming from because that means it's, it's open, right? It's open for everybody. If you're interested, just uh, take the first step, as you mentioned. Fantastic, Winston. Thank you so much for your time. I uh, really appreciate uh, you talking to us about this topic. And again, one of the really very important topics. Uh, and I think moving forward, it will continue to be and probably even grow in importance uh, moving forward. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.